society. Now, as we take a closer look here in this walk with God, I want you to notice two things. Notice, notice first of all here, he changed his ways after becoming a dad. He changed his ways after becoming a dad. Notice verses 21 and 22 again. And Enoch lived sixty and five years and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah three hundred years and begat sons and daughters. So verse 21 there says uh, that Enoch was sixty-five when Methuselah was born. How would you like to start a family at sixty-five? Let's keep in mind here that uh, they lived a lot longer back then. But here we are. The Bible says that Enoch began to walk with God after his first child was born. Now, why do you think Enoch changed his ways after he became a dad? You know, sometimes, uh, in some instances, not always, but in some instances, becoming a parent really sends a shock into your system. You realize, hey, I've got a human being who's depending on me for the rest of their life. I'm responsible for this individual. And sometimes becoming a parent will get some people to consider their relationship with God. But I believe that there's more to it than just that. I believe that God spoke to Enoch because the word, uh, as he named his son Methuselah, the name Methuselah actually means when he is dead, it shall come. Now, in Bible times, they didn't pick babies' names out of a cute little book. Every child's name had a meaning to it, and it was given for a reason. So Enoch names his son when the end comes, uh, excuse me, when he is dead, it shall come. So now, if he were to do the math, when Methuselah died after 969 years, that's when the great flood came and God destroyed the earth. You see, God, I believe, spoke to Enoch when his son was born, and he told him, judgment's coming, Enoch. There's a day coming when your son dies that I will send judgment to the earth. And I believe Enoch was motivated by the message that judgment is coming. He was motivated to walk, begin a walk with God. May I say to you this morning, men, women, Young men, young women, single and married people. If for no other reason you need to come to Christ because and seek Christ and walk with Christ because there's a day of judgment coming. Now you and I may not see it, but think about this. Enoch named his son. It would be 969 years later, but God's judgment came. And I believe based on God's word, judgment's coming. We know that. We don't know when. But the judgment of God is coming to this earth. And you and I had better be prepared for that judgment. You see, Enoch is unique as a father because the Bible says there's only two men. Excuse me. The Bible says only two, uh, two men had a walk with God and Enoch was one of those. So what does it mean to walk with God? It means that Enoch had opened up his heart and his life and he received the Lord. May I ask you this morning, have you ever opened up your heart and life? Have you received Christ? Are you walking with Him? Do you have a relationship with Him? That's what matters this morning. Have you have a relationship with Jesus? Has there been a place in time where you repented of your sins and placed your faith in Jesus Christ? Now, walking with the Lord also means that Enoch and God was going the same way. You can't walk with somebody if you're walking against them. If you're contrary to them, you're not walking with them. You see, that means that God and Enoch walked in the same direction. That they, they, Enoch embraced God's will. He embraced God's thoughts. He embraced God's way. So Enoch is walking with God. So let me ask you this morning, Dad, are you walking in the same direction as the Lord? Or are you finding yourself walking contrary to the Lord? You see, this morning, dads and moms and everybody else is who claim to follow Christ, we are to submit our will and to follow Jesus. We are to head the same way that Jesus is for his heading. We are to pursue the things that he pursues and we are to take the steps that he's taking. You see, here's what we often do if we just be honest. We get started in something and then we ask God to join us. We don't follow God. 
We don't follow Jesus. We don't do, uh, we don't walk uh, side by side, footstep and footstep. We do our own thing and then we ask God to get involved. We ask God to bless. But I want you to know something here. What does the text say? Does the text say God walked with Enoch? Or did Enoch walk with God? You see the difference? God didn't walk with Enoch. Enoch walked with God. Enoch was going the way God was going. He was doing the things God was doing. He was walking the direction of God. Now, contrary to the silly bumper stickers and the license plates you see on some vehicles, God will never, ever be your co-pilot. God is not, no, he's not anybody's co-pilot. He's either the pilot or he's not on board. You see, God is not our co-pilot. If we're going to walk with Him, we're to go His way, and we're to go His way, and when we go His way, we'll be different than the society around us. So as we consider the fact here that He that walked with God, we find here He changed His ways after He became a dad. But secondly, we find here also, He continued His walk in spite of darkness. He continued His walk in spite of of darkness. Now, to understand just fully how unique Enoch was, we need to understand how corrupt society was in his day. Now, you see, Enoch was the great grandfather of Noah. You know, if you go over to chapter 6, the Bible has something to say about Noah's days. In Genesis 6 5, the Bible says, And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, even if Enoch's days were a little bit better than his great grandson Noah's, we still find evidence that, uh, that Enoch's lived in a perverted society. You see, if you go back to chapter 4, we meet this guy named Lamech. Lamech and Enoch were cousins. If you read there about Lamech, Lamech had two wives. That tells you up front he wasn't very intelligent. So he had two wives. Number one, he never broke the Lord's uh, uh, commands on marriage. But we find there, if you read chapter 4, Enoch shares and sings a song to his wives bragging about murder. So we find that Lamech is a reflection of a society where sexual immorality wasn't a big deal and murder wasn't a big deal. So this is happening. Enoch's cousin, Lamech, lived the same time Enoch did. Lamech is going around uh, flaunting his sexual immorality and bragging about killing people. You see the society that Enoch lived in? Enoch lived in a time when the things were spiritually dark. But notice here. While things were getting worse and worse and men were heading towards the judgment of God, Enoch was heading closer and closer to God. Enoch was walking with God. Enoch was heading towards his heavenly home. He wasn't like the society around him. You see, the fact that Enoch continued his walk with God in spite of the darkness around him challenges you and I to evaluate our own lives today. In case you hadn't figured out, it's getting spiritually dark in our country. Day by day, the spiritual darkness grows a little darker and a little darker and a little darker. You see, as followers of Christ, you and I are to be like Enoch. We're to continue our walk with God in spite of the darkness around us. We're in this world, but we're not of this world. Amen. As we learned in Wednesday night, we are pilgrims and strangers. We're travelers simply going through this life. This is not our final home. And we're to be light and spiritual darkness. You see, we're in this world, but we're not to be like the world. We're to be the same. You know the problem is today, too many people who claim to be Christians live just like everybody else around them, and the world has no clue of what the light of Jesus is about. Amen. We're living in a dark, spiritually dark world. Father, as the leader of your home, you're setting the spiritual direction in your home, Dad. The way you go is the way your family is going to be prone to follow. You see, Dad, you need to have a relationship with Jesus. Amen. You need to be walking with God. You need to walk with Him daily in spite of the spiritual darkness around you. You listen, Dad, it's our job to show our family how to follow Jesus. 
start you off, they have to do that. So we find here Enoch is unique because he walked with God. Number secondly, Enoch is unique because Enoch witnessed for God as well. Enoch witnessed for God. Now the Old Testament doesn't have doesn't give us any commentary on the things that Enoch may have said while he was on the earth. But when we come to the New Testament, we find a record of what some things that Enoch had to say while he was here. As we consider here how Enoch witnessed for God, I want you to think about two things with me. First of all, I want you to think about the message from his lips. The message from his lips. Now, if you go over to the last book of the Bible, there's Revelation. And you come back, one little book is called Jude. And in the book of Jude, we find a record of something Enoch said while he was here on this earth. In Jude, verses 14 and 15, the Bible says, And Enoch also the seventh from Adam prophesied of thee, saying, This is what he told the world around him. Listen. Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Enoch is warning those around him that God is coming in his judgment. He's telling them, hey, you are rebelling against God, but God is coming one day, and he will pass judgment. He's witnessing to the world that there's coming a day of reckoning. Enoch reminds us that whether, uh, whether this sinful world wants to hear it or not, as believers, we're to share the truth of God's Word. We're to witness and tell the world that Jesus is coming and that He is coming to judge one day. Now, our society is currently working frantically to silence Christians, to pressure Christians, manipulate Christians, and to, and to, to uh, manipulate churches into being quiet and not preach the Bible. But may I remind you this morning, friends, that God's people are to always speak out and witness in the world. Remember when Peter and John got in trouble in the book of Acts of preaching Jesus? You know what they said in Acts 4.20 the council says, you guys don't be preaching Jesus anymore. Listen to what they said. They said, we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. You see, he spoke out to his world. He witnessed to his world. He proclaimed the truth of God's word. He proclaimed that the Lord was coming. And he proclaimed that the Lord would come and bring judgment. You see, he witnessed for God. We see the message from His lips. He verbally speaks. And I want you to notice here the message from His life. The message from His life. You see, here's where we as Christians often make a mess. We say one thing and do another. Enoch not only walked, excuse me, talked the talk, he walked the talk as well. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, we find what many call the Hall of Faith. The Hall of Fame. In verse 5, this is what the book of Hebrews has to say about Enoch in Hebrews 11, 5. The Bible says, by faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him for before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. Don't say the last word again. He had this testimony that he pleased God. Before God took him out of this world he had a testimony everyone around him they heard the message from his lips they heard the Lord is coming, judgment is coming when he brings, he comes here to bring judgment. But they also looked at his life and they said, he lives what he says. His life proclaimed the message. You know, whether you realize it or not, every person in this room who claims to be a follower of Christ is a walking billboard for Jesus. You may be false advertising. But you're advertising something for Jesus. 
You see, the world in which Enoch lived, not only heard the words he spoke, they saw the kind of life that he lived. You see, Enoch pointed people to the Lord with his lips and with his life. Let's go to imaginary journey for just a moment. Let's imagine if you and I had been at the Brook Funeral Home here in McKenzie. If you go past the register, you see all these people. A lot of familiar faces you recognize, people you know. And you realize you've been granted this unusual opportunity to attend your own funeral. As you come into the chapel, you see all these people you've known, you've worked with, you've bought stuff from, you've lived by them, you've gone to church with them, you know them at the ball games and everywhere else, and you're hearing people talking about you. And you're seeing everyone's reaction at your funeral. May I ask you this morning, what would people be saying about you at your funeral? Well, he attended that Bethel Baptist Church out there on the highway. That's about as far as I could say I could ever see anything in his life. Would you and I, if someone, if we were to be able to have the opportunity to attend our own funeral, would we have the testimony? Would people be able to say, hey, you can say what you want to about James Hazelwood, but he pleased God. <laughs> you see, can that be said about you and I? If we went to our own funeral and we overheard what was being said, if the preacher got up and was honest, would the preacher be able to say with 100% confidence that you and I had pleased God? Enoch had the testimony. Everybody around him said, you can say what you want to about Enoch, but he pleased God. You see, that's how you and I ought to live. Not worrying about anybody else's opinion, but worrying about what God says about us. And whatever else anybody else says about us when we die, we should have the desire that people can honestly say, not uh, trying to, uh, to, to build us up, but to be honest and say that we please God with our lives. Amen. As we continue here, look at this unique father. Methuselah's father, Enoch. We find that Enoch walked with God. Enoch witnessed for God. Finally, I want you to notice here, praise God. Enoch went to God. <laughs> Enoch went to God. Now here's the thing. While on earth, Enoch didn't live like anybody else. And he didn't die like anybody else either. Don't miss this. This is good. Hang on now. Don't shout, all right? As we look here at Enoch, I want you to notice two things here about how Enoch went to God. First of all, I want you to notice here the explanation we're given for Enoch's visit, uh, exit. Excuse me. The explanation we're given for Enoch's exit. Go back to Genesis chapter 5 there. Let's look at verse 24 again. That's what the Bible says there in Genesis 5, 24. And Enoch walked with God. But with this, and he was not. What happened? For God took him. Amen. Amen. Don't miss this. One moment. Enoch is walking with God. He has this close, intimate relationship with God. He's strolling down the street, and the next minute he's gone. Amen. He disappears. He's here one moment and gone the next. Now here's what I want you to understand. Go back to Hebrews 11 5. The Bible says there that Enoch was translated. What's that word translated mean? It means to be moved to another place. Don't well, miss this. G. Campbell Morgan used to tell the great preacher, used to say about the little girl who, in Sunday school one Sunday, they studied the lesson of Enoch and she went home. And this is how the little girl explained to her parents about Enoch. She said, Mom, one day Enoch and God were walking. And they walked and they walked and they kept walking and they got so far along, God just said, Enoch, you're closer to my house, won't you just come on home with me? <laughs> Isn't that great? Children can be sometimes on the money. But here's what I want you to see. <coughs> Hebrews 11.5 not only says that it was translated, that means he was taken from one place to another, 
The Bible says in Hebrews 11, 5, he was not found. They're looking for ink. Have you seen ink? I saw him and God another day. If you see him go over his friend's house, have you been over to Aunt Nails? Have you been to his grandmother's? They're looking for Enoch, but he could not be found. Why? Because God took him home to heaven. Amen. He went to God. What a glorious picture it is here. He was one day here, and the next moment he's gone. So that's the explanation we're given. For Enoch's exit. Notice here finally, as we finish up here this morning, the example we're given from Enoch's exit. The Bible says Enoch didn't see death. What a thought. You know, in the Old Testament, we find only one other count close to this. In 2 Kings chapter 2, we're told that Elijah left this world on a fiery chariot and went to heaven. Don't miss this. Enoch and Elijah were the only two men to leave this world in the Old Testament without experiencing death. They were here one moment and gone the next. Think about this. Neither one of them went through the grave. However, as we think about Enoch here being an example, and Elijah too being an example, how do we decipher this? I bet when you get the New Testament, we have it explained to us. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 17, you probably heard this in a few moments. The Bible says, But I will not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For, for if or since we believe, that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Now don't miss this. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. You catch that caught up part? Does that sound like Enoch? He's walking with God. He's caught up one moment. He didn't experience death, but he left this world and went to God. Amen. Hallelujah. It's a picture of the rapture there. Amen. Here one moment. Call the next. Just like that. You see, the truth is, when King Jesus comes one day, the bodies of those believers resting in the earth will be raised to receive a body incorruptible. First Corinthians talks about that. And then following them, those who arrive will be God. Amen. Go to God. You see, friends. What a unique character in the kids. I close with this story this morning. A little boy come home from the church one Sunday and his dad was sitting there in the easy chair watching a ball game. Dad didn't go to church. And we find that the little boy knew dad was watching the ball game. Of course, he was a little anxious. He didn't know how to approach his dad. He began to kind of Mingling around his dad's leg, and then finally he jumped up in his dad's lap. His dad never took his eyes off the ball game. He kind of gave him a hug. He said, Dad, you know what my Sunday school teacher asked me this morning, church? And dad never looked up. He's still watching the ball game. He said, Son, what your, what's your teacher ask you this morning? The little boy said, Dad, the Sunday school teacher asked me that when I die, where do I want to go? And the dad turned from the TV and he looked at his son. He said, son, what was your answer? The little boy cut his mouth. He climbed up closer to his daddy's ears and he whispered this. I told my Sunday school teacher I wanted to go where my daddy goes. Hmm. 
Dad, Daddy. I hope you understand this morning that you are leaving your home. You know, I begin to ponder on this, and I don't know if we thought about this enough. Without going into all the biological details, Dad, you had part in bringing your child, this, your child or children this morning. But have you ever considered that your child or children is a part of eternity? Listen, Dad, don't miss this. You and I had part, just part, in bringing a piece of eternity into this life. Because you see, our children will live eternally somewhere. Our children will either live and spend eternity in heaven, or they'll spend eternity in hell. You and I have a part in bringing that peace of eternity in this world. But Dad, hear me this morning. You and I are also going to have a part on where they end up. you got a lot of children who are just like little boys says, I want to go where my daddy goes. There's a lot of children who will follow their daddy all the way to hell. Dad, I ask you this morning, if you leave this world in the next few moments, where will you spend eternity? And if you leave this world in the next few moments and your children follow you, where will your children end up spending eternity? I'm done here. And it reminds us of three truths. First of all, you better be prepared to leave this world saved. Amen. You better be prepared to leave this world saved. You see, I ask you this morning, ma'am, sir, young man, young woman, have you ever received Christ as your Savior? Are you prepared to leave this world safe? Are you walking with God? Do you know Christ? Have you ever received Christ? If you're not saved, maybe God's dealing with your heart this morning about being saved. I invite you to come just a matter of moments. Secondly, not only should you and I better be prepared to leave this world safe, you better be prepared to leave this world suddenly. You and I better be prepared. One moment he is here, one moment he's gone. You say, well, the Lord may not rapture me out of here. He may not, but death is that quick. One moment you're taking a breath here, one moment you're next, you could be out into eternity. No matter when death comes, you and I are not going to be fully prepared for it. You better be prepared to leave this world safe. And third, you better be prepared to leave this world safe. You see, as Enoch walked with God, had that intimacy and that fellowship, that equates to being, hey, I'm serving God. You and I cannot leave a better legacy leaving this world and for people to say, have the testimony that we please God, but they also were serving God. Dad, we ought to be serving God. We ought to lead our kids. Our kids ought to look at us and see examples of a servant of God. I'm going to ask for the Paul from this camp to come over and have a song of invitation this morning. Dad, maybe you need to come this morning and get in the altar and say, you know what, I, I'm not the spiritual leader I need to be. Listen, I, guys, I'm not here to beat up on you. Dads get beat up on enough. I'm not trying to beat up on you, but I'm trying to hold you accountable, man. You know what, I, I, something I, as I get older, I appreciate more and more is accountability. Sometimes we need somebody to look us in the eye and say, get your act together. Because we get loosey goosey and we begin to, well, nobody cares enough about me to challenge. You see, our society has confused this idea that if you speak the truth, you don't love someone. I've got a Greek word for that that's baloney. <laughs> because if you genuinely love someone, you will speak the truth to them. It's not that we don't love whoever is in whatever type of sin. We love them enough to tell them the truth. And I love you as your pastor, and I'm telling somebody this morning the truth that you need to get your house in order. It's men, it's mothers. We need to get our houses in order. We need to be walking with God, and we need to be witnessing for God so that one day we can go to God. Amen. If you're here this morning, you need Christ as your Savior, I invite you to come. 
As we stand and sing one another, Brother Walter. Number 119 in the Red Book. 119 in the Red Book. Won't you come if God's speaking to you? Obey the Spirit this morning. Are you washing the blood of the 